financial problems, elder law, tax problems, business matters, divorce, personal injury, bankruptcy, your life, your reality. Life is complicated. There is the law and there is reality. Welcome to Law and Reality, sponsored by Thav Gross. Now, here's your host, Ken Gross. Welcome to this segment of Law and Reality. Today's topic is solving the tax problem, part two. First off, good morning, Jenny Lingle. Good morning, Ken. Good to be here. We've got you back because we talked a couple weeks back. We were dealing with tax problems and we didn't get through the whole topic because David has tax issues and we said we'd continue it yep. and this is the continuation. <laughs> Before we get into it, I want to say good morning to Jeff Kirshner. Ken, thanks for having me back for part two. I was here at part one and I would never miss part two. Brian Small. You know, Ken. You're for, very welcome, Jeff. I, I've been here for the last 21 years. Part one, part two, part 98, they, they all go together. And, and it's it, all been tax fun. Tax problems and never end. And it's all been exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about David. David owns his own business. He's very aggressive when it comes to the preparation of his tax returns. He does file on time. This is good. If you remember the last show that we were talking about tax problems, we were focusing on this issue of Failing to file your tax return on time can, in three circuits, can result in precluding you from any right to filing a bankruptcy to discharge the taxes. Plus, failing to file your return on time uh, ends up putting you in a situation where you pay up to a 25% penalty. That's not David's issue. David is very aggressive in how he prepares his tax return. He doesn't keep any double entry bookkeeping records. He provides his accountant with statements listing his expenses for each year. Let's say he's ultra aggressive on claiming expenses and he's somewhat sloppy when it comes to reporting all of his income. Here's his problem. IRS has come in and audited his returns for 2015 and 2016. They've claimed that he underreported his business income by $195,000. They have denied deductions of $125,000. The audit claims a deficiency of $320,000 plus a 50% fraud penalty plus interest. He's in here to see Jenny and me to help him deal with this audit problem. And the question is, how does the process work and what do we do for David? Well, the first thing is it would be great if David came in when he got the letter. So the first audit. The, the first audit letter before he went to the audit because it's likely in this situation that David's aware that there's a problem. Even if he doesn't know the extent that he's underreported his income or to the extent that uh, he's taken expenses in excess of what he can prove, he likely knows at this point that there's going to be some sort of issue. So it's best if David seeks counsel at the beginning so that we can plan out the strategy for moving forward. A absolutely critically important point. What is, so what oftentimes is it, David, David didn't do it this time and many Davids don't, some do. What, what does that letter look like? What is it going to say, that first one that people seem to it's, ignore? It's very ugly. <laughs> it's a, it's, just, it's a it's short just like, letter, but it's a very ugly letter. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, people get correspondence all the time, and if you're, if you're in that mode where you're not paying your taxes, you get tons of letters from the IRS. Well, what, what, what are you looking case, for? What is it going to say? This letter is actually going to schedule a meeting, an in-person meeting. It's not just going to be a standard letter saying you owe X. It's going to say you need to meet in our office on such and such date. I, I may show my age, but do any of you know what paragoric is? Have you ever heard of it? I'll go with no. Paragoric <laughs> is an old medication Cough syrup. that you used to take if you were nauseous. Oh. And it did one of two things when you would take it. This is when I was a kid. You would either vomit within three minutes or your stomach was settled. The audit letter that comes for David with his background, when he reads that short paragraph scheduling the conference, is what I call 
a Paragoric letter. Ah. I bet it does not settle your stomach, though. And I bet you it, it creates yeah, and, nausea, I bet, right and I bet ginger ale doesn't help either. So. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing that I unfortunately have a lot of clients say, well, I want to hire an attorney. I don't want to go. I'm just not going to cooperate. For the most part, at some point, if this is an in-person audit, you're going to have to show up and answer questions. And there's a standard list of questions that the revenue agent or auditor is going to ask you regarding your business, trying to figure out how you operate it and where there might be errors on the return. So here's where we go kind of in the discussion on two roads. Because road A would be if David came into us at the beginning of the audit before this process started, we would be adopting a strategy along certain ways to protect him as much as possible, including what he says and how that interview is handled, versus door B is David did it all on his own, or David used his accountant only, and his accountant wasn't very well versed in handling important big audits, and now David's in here because he's got the letter, which is a different letter. What letter does David have when he's telling him he owes $320,000 plus a 50% penalty? Well, at that point, he would have a, we call it a 90-day letter or a notice of deficiency. Um, and this letter is extremely important because it's the only letter that gives you the right to contest and force the IRS to review it at a, at a higher level. So if you fail to respond to that, and you don't sign off on the report, your only other option is to file for reconsideration, but at that point, you're begging for mercy. So what we want to do is file a petition to the U.S. Tax Court within that 90 days uh, so that we can be assigned to an appeals officer. So the first thing I'm noticing in Dave's case is you put him at uh, a 50% civil fraud penalty. He could It could be as high as 75%. And I find typically the revenue agents, when they decide to assess a civil fraud penalty, will put you at the 75% which is the highest range by going through the appeals office so we just put it in numbers that means three hundred and twenty thousand dollars plus if it's fifty percent another hundred and fifty thousand if it's seventy five percent it's another two hundred twenty five thousand now in a case like a lot Dave's, of money we're typically not going to be able to zero out that penalty however we should be able to, assuming Dave didn't do some very nefarious things, get him down to 20% accuracy-related penalty. Right. Well, we're, gonna, we're gonna come to a break, and we're going to kind of take the case and say, how do we approach the situation and the issues to see if we can solve Dave's problem? Is the debt piling up? Struggling to get by? It's all about preserving future income. Bankruptcy is one option. When it's right, it's the least costly, most effective way to save your home, eliminate a second mortgage, and wipe out credit card debt. But you need to address the problem now. We help people with bankruptcy. Call the experts. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. Carrying too much debt? Resolve your debt. Call Thav Gross. You don't need to be broke, and you don't need to hit rock bottom. If you have income and you're struggling with debt, dump it. Think about the next 10 or 20 years. If you do what the banks tell you, you'll have nothing to retire with. There is a solution. Don't waste your future. Call Fav Gross. We're experts at eliminating credit card debt. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. A lifetime of hard work. If you don't have the right plan in place, you can lose your home, your savings, and more. And you didn't come this far to lose everything. Samasco Law wants you to know that laws are changing. Today, the average cost of nursing home care is $85,000 a year. With proper planning, we can help protect your life savings and get you the Medicaid and nursing home benefits you deserve. How much can you afford to lose? Call Samasco Law today. If you're retired and in a financial crisis, there is a way out. It pains me when I see a retired couple exhaust their savings by paying credit card bills and for a home hopelessly underwater. Fav Gross specializes in helping retired people in financial crisis. You just can't keep paying until you're broke. You need to address the problem now. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. You can't work. You have to deal with pain and stress. Worse yet, our system for applying for disability benefits seeks to deny you the benefits you're entitled. Jeff Kirshner is an expert in obtaining disability and workers' compensation benefits for his clients. 
You need to call Jeff before you apply or after you're denied to get the benefits you deserve. 888-235-HELP. 888-235-HELP. All right, so let's deal with Dave's problem. He's got this 90-day letter, which in the 90-day letter, it's jurisdictional, just so that we, 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 a little bit of lawyer talk. If Dave doesn't file his tax court petition within the 90 days, his only way of contesting the tax is to pay it and then sue for a refund. And Dave doesn't have $525,000. Well, the other way to contest it, there's one other way, and it's to request reconsideration saying you have an additional documentation, but you're at their mercy whether they want to do it, it or it, not. Well, can, they can want, you, they can, can say you, no. Can they you can request no. the reconsideration while you're in the 90-day period, and does that stop the 90-day period no. from running? No, absolutely not. There is no... I, the first case I ever handled out of law school was a tax court case dealing with a 90-day letter. And believe me, there is nothing. The President of the United States <laughs> cannot stop the 90 days, and it's jurisdictional. You either file your petition within that time <clears throat> or you're out. That's why you always take them to the post office yourself yes. when you file them. I, I do. Even if I've still got 60 days to go, I go, I stand in line at the post office, I get my stamp, and I breathe that sigh of relief. How low of the likelihood of success is it if you go to reconsideration? Um, reconsideration is much more difficult. First of all, you have to convince them to take it. I've got one I'm trying to convince the IRS to take right now. I've got boxes of receipts to show them. And I've had to go through the taxpayer advocate. It's been over a year, and we're still not assigned. Plus, they're the last shot. They don't have to weigh um, the cost and the risk of going to trial. So we go back to that kind of black and white interpretation where we don't get any of that wiggle room of negotiation. Yeah, think of it this way. If you're, in tax court, if you're in tax court, that's a legal forum where you have your chance. You get to box. You're in the boxing ring. You've got gloves. You're, in, you're near there, and the IRS has their gloves, and you can fight it out, and you can win. When you're asking for reconsideration, there's no boxing ring. You're sending a letter and you're, getting on the please. phone, and you're saying, yes, can you, well, listen, I have a sympathetic case. If they're not sympathetic to listening to you, they can say, no, no soup for you. Is there, an element, comes down is there an element as to you have to establish why you missed that 90-day mark? Uh, no, They're, they don't really require that for reconsideration, but I find it's, it's very stressful getting there, and, and the first first part to just get them to look at that um, but once they do is they're still I would say more skewed towards the revenue agent saying well tell me why the auditor was wrong whereas when you get to appeals it kind of is almost like a fresh start let's let's take a look at this again all right so let's all right so we we filed our tax court petition all right so Dave is now looking at it and, and Jenny and I are going over the audit report and we've talked to Dave and Dave's accountant and we've gathered the records the first thing we do is look to see if the IRS is wrong and how can we undermine their argument. And believe it or not, this, I think this is, will come as a surprise to a lot of people. They are oftentimes wrong. Now, I know the government is wrong. Some of Never. the government <laughs> representatives kidding. that might be watching this show are saying, oh, evil Ken and evil Jenny. But they make mistakes. And they take positions that are aggressive, that are beyond the reach that they should. Our job is to find out if they're right or they're wrong. And if they're wrong, we have to prove it. Well, and a lot of times what will happen is a revenue agent or an auditor will be handling so many cases, many more cases than they, they should technically be handling. So I've gotten 90-day uh, letters written up, and I'll be like, but we proved this. We provide it to you on X. And the revenue agents, because of the fact that they are understaffed, are, are kind of at that point, well, you know what to do at the next level. So I don't necessarily think that they're always taking aggressive stances, and, and, and sometimes they're just wrong because human error. It happens. Let me give you an example. What we would do first is the revenue agent has, in the report, is saying he underreported his income by 195000 That means typically what they've done is they've pulled the bank statements because he doesn't have double entry accounting anyway, and they've tallied the deposits, and the deposits came to $195,000 more than what was reported on the tax return, and the auditor immediately concluded that that's income. But it may not be, because sometimes a client will have two bank accounts and will be transferring money from account A to account B, or will be loaning the company money and then paying the loan back. 
If you loan your company money, it's not income, it's a loan. So what we do is we go through the bank statements to see maybe the auditor was wrong in concluding the $195,000. I think we just had a case just we like We do, that. absolutely. I think we have to remember at the audit process with appeals and, and working with the attorney, the idea is to get to the right number. The idea is to try and figure out what actually happened and, and what should have been reported and how much that is. It's not for us to say, let's get it down to zero even though you owe 20000 and it's not for the IRS to say, let's get 300000 even though you owe 20000 We're all trying, for the most part, to get down to what the correct number is. In the case that Ken's referring to, we had a client and he had three bank accounts. And each bank account was used for something different and deposits basically went into one main account and then he would move them. Well, he had an accountant that year who was a little bit sloppy and he figured out what their gross receipts were by just adding the total deposits into all three accounts. He then went and realized, well, we transfer into account two and he deducted what he what was transferred into account two, but he missed deducting what was transferred into account three. So that resulted in overreporting so by 300000 In this particular case, our client himself, before they came to us, overreported his income. In our example, suppose the auditor gives us a statement in the 195000 the auditors made the analysis incorrectly. We point that out. All of a sudden, we, and if, if we're right, we eliminate that 195000 Then the next question comes down to all these expenses that were disallowed. Did the auditor disallow the expenses because she felt or he felt that the taxpayer was playing games with the return? If the auditor gets to that conclusion, they'll be very quick to deny the expenses unless you have the absolute proof of every single expense. Chances are, the way I'm looking at it with Dave, there's probably a lot of that in there. When we come back, we'll talk more about the expense side in an audit, and then we'll talk about how you wrap it up and how you end up dealing with paying whatever the tax is. We'll be back after the break. Tax problems are major problems. Don't let the IRS levy your wages and seize your assets. There is a solution. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. If you're behind on your taxes and owe money to the IRS, call Thav Gross. We've been solving tax problems for 32 years. We stop wage levies, resolve unfiled returns, and obtain the best possible settlements. Call Thav Gross today, 888-235-HELP. A lifetime of hard work. If you're approaching retirement and don't have the right plan in place, you can lose your home, your investments, and your savings. And you didn't come this far to lose everything. Putting a solid strategy in place with Samasco Law legally protects your assets as well as your wishes. Since a will doesn't cover you medically or financially, Samasco Law goes beyond ordinary asset management protection to safeguard everything you have. How much can you afford to lose? Call Samasco Law today. Carrying too much debt? Resolve your debt. Call Thav Gross. You don't need to be broke and you don't need to hit rock bottom. If you have income and you're struggling with debt, dump it. Think about the next 10 or 20 years. If you do what the banks tell you, you'll have nothing to retire with. There is a solution. Don't waste your future. Call Thav Gross. We're experts at eliminating credit card debt. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. If you're retired and in a financial crisis, there is a way out. It pains me when I see a retired couple exhaust their savings by paying credit card bills and for a home hopelessly underwater. Fav Gross specializes in helping retired people in financial crisis. You just can't keep paying until you're broke. You need to address the problem now. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. Time for announcements. I want to remind our viewers to listen to us Tuesdays, 1130 and Saturdays, 7 a.m. for Law & Reality Live on Praise 102.7. On Thursdays, 3 to 4 p.m., Law & Reality Now on 9, 10 a.m. Be sure and sign up for our monthly contest. Free $50 Visa gift card, Lawn Reality hat, and copy of my book, Dump Your Debt. Go to the websites, click on the link, and you can sign up. We have seminars coming up. On Wednesday, March 28th, 6 to 7.30 p.m., spring is the time to shed the debt, not trim it. We're going to go through all the methods and systems we use to preserve future income for you and your family. The focus isn't as much on eliminating debt as it is on preserving your future income flow. Jeff Kirshner will join us for a special segment on disability claims. Attendees get a free copy of my book, Dump Your Debt. 
Sign up at lawnreality.com, thavgross.com, or call 888-235-HELP. On Wednesday, April 25th, 6 to 7.30 p.m., we have an estate planning seminar called How to Avoid and How to Survive Probate. Estate planning is a must. Jeff Linden's going to join us. He's our probate expert. Brian Small and I are going to go over estate planning. We're going to go over all the elements of an estate plan, the process of probate, how to deal with a probate fight, documents that you need to have, how to avoid the problems from the situations arising through probate. Attendees get a free $300 gold certificate off the cost of any estate plan. Sign up at lawnreality.com, thavgross.com, or call 888-235-HELP. Want to remind our viewers, you're always welcome to come to Thav Gross for a free consultation. Just go to the websites, click help, or call, or call the office at 888-235-HELP. Debt issues, tax issues, estate planning issues, business issues, probate issues, elder law issues with Pat Samasco, disability issues with Jeff Kirshner. It's all available to you. Just go to the websites, request the consult, or sign up, or, or call 888-235-HELP. Also, go to the websites for free reports. There's a great report on how to save your home from foreclosure, business formations and loans and grants for small businesses in Michigan, and the Retiree's Guide, from so uh, Retiree's Guide to Social Security by Pat Samasco. I want to thank our sponsors, Stav Gross, Samasco Law, Jeff Kirshner Law. Now back to the show. Is the debt piling up? Struggling to get by? It's all about preserving future income. Bankruptcy is one option. When it's right, it's the least costly, most effective way to save your home, eliminate a second mortgage, and wipe out credit card debt. But you need to address the problem now. We help people with bankruptcy. Call the experts. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. 888-235-HELP. That's 888-235-HELP. You can't work. You have to deal with pain and stress. Worse yet, our system for applying for disability benefits seeks to deny you the benefits you're entitled. Jeff Kirshner is an expert in obtaining disability and workers' compensation benefits for his clients. You need to call Jeff before you apply or after you're denied to get the benefits you deserve. 888-235-HELP. 888-235-HELP. Tax problems are major problems. Don't let the IRS levy your wages and seize your assets. There is a solution. We're Thav Gross. Our firm will solve your problem. If you're behind on your taxes and owe money to the IRS, call Thav Gross. We've been solving tax problems for 32 years. We stop wage levies, resolve unfiled returns, and obtain the best possible settlements. Call Thav Gross today, 888-235-HELP. All right, so back to Dave. All right, so we, Jenny and I were able to analyze it, and let's go on the assumption that the 195,000 overstated income is now reduced to 40,000 of, 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 of understated income. Now we're looking at this 125,000 of expenses were, were denied. They denied everything. They denied all of his auto expense. They denied all of his uh, legal expenses. But there are expenses there. The question is, does this happen, Jenny? Do they just deny things arbitrarily? Wait, wait before you even answer that, what happens to that 50% penalty that they assessed? You just proved that it wasn't 195 overstated, uh, understated. It was down to $40,000. And that's sloppy, but it, it doesn't seem to be outrageous. It gives, based gives us a, a better um, platform to argue that maybe this should have just been the accuracy-related penalty, which is, a, which is more of a 20%. Um, penalty. Understand okay. something. Forty thousand dollars of understated income isn't peanuts. Right. No, but, but compared but to one ninety five. But compared to one ninety five, it's just yeah, hey, one ninety five, only forty. He didn't do anything yeah, wrong. But the this tax is... on forty thousand dollars is a whole lot less than the tax on one hundred and ninety five thousand dollars. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. one nine one hundred and fifty five thousand dollar difference. Yeah. <laughs> times up to 75% in terms of the penalty. So, but my question is on expenses. Do they, I mean, how do they deal with it? You know, like, I, I know the classic one that you and I always talk about is you're a trucker and the auditor denies all of your fuel expense because you don't have the receipts. Well, what Jenny and I come in in that situation, we say, well, then how did he get from point A to point B if he didn't buy gas? And how many miles did he, and, and how many runs did he make, and what were the distances? And once you can prove how much he traveled using the trucks, 
you can impute how much the gasoline costs based upon the average cost of fuel and consumption. And that was one of my, when I first started out, one of my first cases in tax court had to do with a truck driver. And in his instance, he actually had the box of receipts. But guess what? Really cheap ink is used at the gas station. We open the box. Oh, they're all faded? They're so faded. They, it was holding them up to the light. Try, I mean, there was absolutely no way to see what 90% of them were. So the revenue agent, and, and instead of being compassionate about that and looking at it, just <laughs> forget it. You're getting zero. So in that case, you go in, and, and, and we're, uh, the first step we're at is we're negotiating in tax court with an appeals officer. Mm -hmm. That's the step that they put you to, and that's, it's kind of like a non-binding process to try and see if you can come to a settlement on the case. Sometimes we're able to settle with appeals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're not. If we're not, then it goes to district counsel, the attorney for the government who's going to try the case. And that, that conference comes close to trial. And then we negotiate there. The thing that people need to realize is litigation is complicated on both sides, and there's always a motivation to settle. The government will also settle. The government will not settle just, quote unquote, to avoid litigation because they have unlimited resources and they have a duty to impose and pursue their tax laws. But it goes beyond that. The attorney doesn't really want to try the case. So if you can find grounds to bridge the gap and settle, you can. So oftentimes we don't, we're not able to settle at appeals because we think we can get a better deal with district counsel. You push it to the edge and then every one, on occasion you have to try the case. But the important thing to know is you don't just accept the letter. Let's conclude on Dave's case. We got the expenses down from 125000 to uh, 25000 of overstated expenses, and there's only $40,000 of unreported income. He's got $65,000 liability now on tax. Well, his tax would actually be lower. If that, that's 65000 So it's a yeah, $20,000 liability. Right. You think we can get his, what, what are we going to do about his penalty? We're going to try and get, at, the, at that point, we're, obviously, I think they're going to give us the accuracy-related penalty at 20%, but we've come so far down on this case, and the reality is um, some of these things that were disallowed, he likely had, we just can't prove it. So we may be able to request abatement of the penalty in this case. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to vote and decide Dave's fate on the penalty. Do you vote to abate or 20 percent? Abate. Abate. Well, I would like it to be abated. It's unanimous. <laughs> We're going to abate Dave's entire penalty. He has no penalty. So uh, here's what you need to know. Thav Gross will waive your penalty, but <laughs> the government may not. We have to convince the government it's the right thing to do. Have a great week. We'll be back next week with Law and Reality. Thanks for watching.